Well, welcome everyone. So this, this talk is part of the WMCTC series and uh, it's also given from um, the University of Birmingham. I, for those of you that know me, I did my chemistry degree. So I was an A-level chemistry student like yourself sitting in the audience. Uh, from my A-levels, I read chemistry as an undergraduate, did BS in chemistry. Um, I did what was called a sandwich course back then, which meant I did two years at university. My third year, I worked in industry um, for a food company, my, my second passion, food. And that was Grand Metropolitan Foods, where I learned analytical chemistry. And very interesting, learning how chemistry can be applied to, 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 to foods and other industries. I then went back to university and uh, I then went back to industry for the as an analytical chemist for the environmental chemistry industry. Then I went to do my PhD and it was there that I did uh, atomistic simulation and modeling. And my PhD supervisor was Saiful Islam, who you may remember has given a talk here previously. After that, I actually went into the nuclear industry. Uh, it was the defense side of the nuclear industry, the atomic weapons establishment. Uh, but I was looking at materials modeling for, um, for corrosion products and uh, the aging components. Then uh, about eight years ago, I moved to University of Birmingham to take up a lectureship position uh, where I was teaching both in chemistry, but also over in physics as well. And I've recently moved over to the National Nuclear Laboratory where I'm now a capability manager for nuclear reactor and physics modeling. But I still hold, uh, like, uh, like Dr. Ray Preveley, he was on here as well. I, I do hold a, an honorary lectureship at the University of Birmingham. So, so I still do things under that umbrella. So that's who I am, that's a little bit of background. And tonight's talk is nuclear energy, modeling the chemistry. Now, as I mentioned, uh, you may think that, well, what's nuclear energy got to do with chemistry? Surely it's all about physicists and engineers. Well, as you'll see, actually, there's a lot of chemistry. The fuel that we use is a ceramic, uranium dioxide. We need to prepare the ore that we dig out the ground into a suitable fuel using chemical processes. After radiation of the fuel, we reprocess using a chemical separation process. Then we store the nuclear waste in purpose-built ceramics and borosilicate glasses. Again, chemists and material scientists are needed. So there's chemistry throughout the whole of the nuclear fuel cycle. So I'm still part of the Birmingham Centre for Nuclear Education and Research. And within the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences, I collaborate, as you can imagine, with colleagues in chemistry, physics and astronomy, and also metallurgy materials as well. And we're also part of a, a virtual centre, which is the Birmingham Energy Institute as well. So there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of, of, of collaboration, and it just goes to show that it is multidiscipline as well. So even though you're a chemist, you can have some interesting products and do some interesting research in a variety of areas. And, and this is just one. Now, those of you that know me know that I like to start with a bit of history because people, when they think of nuclear energy, think, well, it was all invented by the Americans and the Manhattan Project. Wrong. First of all, Lisa Meitner uh, proposed the fission process back in 39. And actually it was the UK that uh, first looked at the feasibility of using uh, uh, atomic weapons before it was then sold to the Americans. So a few slides just to show you some interesting connections and the link with chemistry and the link with Birmingham. So in 1939, it was in the open literature. This was published. Lisa Meitner was an eminent professor at a Berlin university. She was highly regarded. And with Otto Frisch, she actually proposed the fission process. They were studying the bombardment of materials with neutrons. And usually they observed the transmutation to build these bigger elements. But it got to a point where they couldn't find any bigger elements. In fact, to their surprise, they found lighter elements. Now, most people swept this under the carpet and carried on, but Lisa might have thought about the problem. And in fact, when she was walking in the rain and a raindrop ran on down her umbrella and formed a little drop at the end and split into two, it gave her the idea that a nucleus was like a droplet of water, a liquid drop, and that could split into two. That's how she discovered that something as big as uranium was splitting into two. And she calculated that when this happened, perhaps barium might be formed. So to prove this fission process, Harness Trustman used chemistry and very sophisticated and accurate analytical techniques to identify the barium in the sample. So chemistry helped prove that the fission process was there. 
Unfortunately, at the time, 1939, Germany was, uh, was under control of, uh, of the Nazis, and Lisa Meitner, being Jewish, obviously was uh, unfortunately not allowed to hold a position. And sadly, she was never really credited at the time for this, this big discovery. Other people took the credit. However, be pleased to know that she did have the last laugh because she has an element named after her, Meitnerium. So um, that's one of the foundations of, uh, of the nuclear uh, industry. Now, around 1939, there's another character that is linked to the University of Birmingham. And here we have Rudy Piles. Now, he came from a very good background. He, again, was, was a German physicist. And in fact, he studied nuclear physicists under Heisenberg. Yes, the same person that came up with quantum physics and the uncertainty principle, and also Pauli as well. So good provenance. He just happened to be in the UK studying at Cambridge in 1939, the same year that Lisa Meitner uh, made this, this publication. Um, but again, also being Jewish, he was naturally very reticent to return back to Germany. So he was uh, invited to come to the University of Birmingham, where he took up a physics lectureship. And he pursued his atomic research with Otto Frisch and James Chadwick. Now, the irony here is that because he was a foreign national, he was not allowed to work on the UK classified project at the time, which was thought to win the war, which was radar. The development of the cavity magnetron, the, uh, the, the, the foundations of radar, yes, another Birmingham invention, another University of Birmingham research invention. But of course, he wasn't allowed to work on that project because it was classified, but they did allow him to work on atomic research. And interestingly, it's a good job he did because at the time, although nuclear fission and the large amount of energy that you get from it was known and was published in the literature, it was regarded as very theoretical. It didn't have a practical purpose. And in fact, even Einstein at the time said, well, yes, it's theoretically possible to build a bomb from this stuff, but it'd be so heavy, there'd be tons of it that it would just be impractical. However, it was Rudy Piles that uh, uh, came up with the theory and the idea that, well, if we just isolate that isotope, the uranium-235 that is fissile, away from everything else, we can concentrate that up and we can devise a bomb that would only weigh uh, just over two pounds or a kilogram. So we've now gone from tons to a kilogram. Something can be dropped by air, by a bomb, and that's a real game changer. That at the time in 1940, he wrote a memorandum, that was a real game changer. And outside the pointing building on, the, on campus, you can see there's a, a blue plaque celebrating Frisch and Piles, where their calculations showed the feasibility of an airborne atomic weapon back in 1940. Now, of course, the trouble was it was in the literature. The Germans had this information as well. Were they doing weapon research? We had to get there first. So uh, Rudy Piles informed the Prime Minister at the time, Sir Winston Churchill, and as all good politicians, they really founded a committee, the Military Application of the Uranium Detonation Committee. But that started to investigate whether this was feasible. We started something called the Tube Alloys Project, and we started working on this. But unfortunately, in 1940, um, the country is very occupied. Um, we didn't have the resources to do this research. So we went to the Americans. Uh, we had to give them the radar stuff as well. But that brought the Manhattan Project into play. So a bit of history. Lisa Meitner discovered fission. It was the UK where this initial concept developed. It then went over to America for the Manhattan Project, and the rest, as you know, is history. So from that, how has nuclear power developed? Well, it's a sad reflection that really it was born out of nuclear weapons, but without that massive input of research, of development, would we have nuclear power today? And you'll see that actually it's a good job all that happened because the development of nuclear power was accelerated dramatically. Could we have done it today? Probably not. If we did, it would take, take decades to get to where we were back then. Now, at the time, they needed to produce plutonium. And one way of doing that is to, is to breed it inside a reactor. So in 1942, Enrico Fermi and his staff designed the first nuclear test reactor. And here it is. It was built, as you can imagine all good scientists, research scientists do, without much health and safety. It was in a squash court, actually. And these uh, black squares are graphite blocks. The uranium fuel was inside. Now, there was no cooling, there was no shielding, there was no safety case, etc. 
but it wasn't designed for prolonged use. It was just a, a test reactor if it's feasible at this scale up. And, and it was, and this led to the other early prototype reactors that then bred the plutonium. Now in the UK, our first reactor was a Magnox reactor, and that came online in 1956, called Hall. In fact, the Queen opened that, and um, that was our first generation. But these were early reactors. And back in the 50s, we didn't think about things like um, decommissioning or the environment much as well. So a lot of the negative views that came from nuclear power really can be ascribed to the, the lack of consideration back then. But as we've moved forward through the generations, we're now at a stage where the reactors are much cleaner, they last longer, they're certainly a lot more safe. And even looking towards the future, as I'll show later on, we're still looking at evolutionary designs that improve the economy, improve the heat, and we can do things like produce hydrogen from the excess heat so we can stimulate the hydrogen fuel cycle. There's a lot more we can do now. Um, and so these are the key concerns that as we move future, we're making them more economical, enhancing the safety, minimizing the waste as well, that's key, but also becoming proliferation resistant so we can't use them to produce any weapons anymore. That's key if you're trying to sell this technology abroad. So back from these early days at the Manhattan Project, a lot has advanced and you'll see that, uh, that for the better. So that's a little history about nuclear power, where it's come from and where we're heading. And before I start talking about a nuclear power station and the chemistry involved, I want to say another issue. Now, for those of you that saw Professor Tuckett's really excellent talk on what I used to call global warming. And global warming, people thought, well, actually, that's rather a nice name. I, I wouldn't mind a, a warmer summer. I wouldn't mind some of the Spanish climate in my garden. I could grow some vines, etc. But of course, that's not what it's about. If you live on the coast, that warming means that you're liable to be flooded. We see climate change. We see, as we're putting a lot more energy in the atmosphere, our weather is changing as well. So we've moved from climate warming to the global climate change. <clears throat> However, that's now become the global climate emergency, and you can see why. Now, I won't repeat what Professor Tuckett said, but there's just a couple of key facts, key take home messages. When you look at the data, now I'm not getting into politics or anything, if you just purely scientifically look at the data, the Earth's average yearly surface temperature, I don't think anyone can deny that since the 80s, it's only going in one direction. It is warming up. That data is corroborated and uh, in fact, even the new American president agrees with it as well. The less said about the former, the better. Now, you might be saying as chemists, yes, I can see the graph, I can see a trend, but on your y-axis, I'm looking at something that's barely one degree Celsius. That's a very small temperature. Surely one degree Celsius doesn't really mean much. Well, the temperature rise actually hides the amount of energy that is going into the system because the majority of our Earth's surface is water, is the oceans. And it takes a lot of heat energy to increase that temperature. Remember to your thermodynamics, you know about heat capacity. Heat capacity is the measure by how much energy you have to put into a system to increase its temperature. And it takes a vast amount of heat energy to raise the temperature of water. So a small degree centigrade rise here, underneath that there's a large amount of heat being stored in the system. So when you look at these, don't be fooled by these small temperature rises. They do signify a lot of heat input into the system. So that's the first stage. So where's this heat coming from? Why, why is our climate heating up? Well, that leads on to the other greenhouse gases. And as, as Richard mentioned, if you just look at the uh, ice core record, where you drill down as the snow is compacted, you can take out some of the bubbles, dissolve the ice and analyze the air. And when you look back at the carbon dioxide content, this is where James Watts uh, developed a steam engine. And for those of you that see my, uh, my steam to nuclear power talk, I talk about the Newcomen engine and the development of steam. But really from the sort of 40s onwards, you can see uh, as he started using um, oil, coal for transportation, for heating, for ele electricity production, again, that started to, to rise pretty exponentially as well. Where's it going? Who knows, but it's certainly going in one direction. So why is carbon dioxide important? Why, why should we worry about carbon? Well, like other greenhouse gases, it actually plays a key role in warming our atmosphere. Very briefly, the sun is producing a lot of energy. 
Now, the sun itself is a very efficient fission reactor. Our local star is a nuclear reactor uh, and it's producing a lot of nuclear energy. That electromagnetic radiation is producing life on Earth. So that's one, um, one fusion reactor up in the sky that is actually life-giving. So that's a reactor, but it's producing heat energy. The solar radiation is absorbed by our Earth. Uh, it heats the Earth up. Now, some of that produces infrared, radiates away, and a lot of it radiates back into space so that infrared radiation is lost in space. The planet cools down. However, some gases in the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, methane, oxide of nitrogen, etc., can actually scatter, absorb, and re-emit this radiation back down to Earth to warm the atmosphere up. The ocean is a heat sink to absorb that heat, and that's responsible for the rise. Now, carbon dioxide isn't the only culprit. There are others. And back in the 80s, we kind of limited our use for CFCs. We now use ammonia as a, as a refrigerant rather than CFCs. Uh, we don't put it in air sprays anymore. But there are others, so we're still mindful of carbon dioxide, but also methane as well. So that, in a nutshell, is some of the key issues that Professor Tucker was talking about. So the problem is that our climate is changing and we need to do something about it. And the way we need to do it is to take these out of the equation. So we need to reduce our carbon dioxide limits. And that's what a lot of countries have agreed to do. What does our government agree to do? Well, it's come up with a carbon plan. And it's actually quite a dramatic one and enshrined in law as well. The target we've got to get to is that by 2050, we're going to reduce our carbon emissions by at least 80% of the 1990 levels. Now that's a huge amount. That's not just five, 10%, that's a dramatic reduction. It's needed, it's required, but how on earth are we going to do it? Especially since by then, our demand for electricity is predicted to double. We need to produce twice as much electricity by then because we're thinking about electrifying our transportation, electric cars, battery technology. Our houses have now got a lot more electric gadgets than before. Now, admittedly, some things have become more efficient, like LED lights, etc. But we're using a lot more electricity across the world. We've all got phones, iPads, computers. So we still need electricity. So there's this, this challenge. We need to generate more electricity, but without the carbon dioxide. And that, to be honest, is the key. So what are we burning? And where does this carbon dioxide come from? Well, I've just gone back to 1998. I used to go back further into the 70s, but of course, no one was born then and they didn't uh, appreciate my jokes about the North Sea gas, et cetera, and when we found it, et cetera. But what's interesting is you can see how things have changed. And they started to change from about 2010 onwards for the better. At the bottom here, you can see uh, th these spikes. So obviously we need more, uh, uh, more coal in winter than we do summer. But this purple baseline here is coal. And from the 98, we were using about 35% of our energy um, by burning coal. Coal was our fuel then. You can see that dramatically reduced from about 2060 onwards. We recognize that burning coal is no longer viable uh, if we want to reduce our CO2 levels. So we've reduced that dramatically. Above that, gas. Yes, we burn a lot of gas and we still burn a fair amount of gas and people think well that's clean I can burn gas it, it's not sooty it doesn't produce the sulfur dioxide the air acid rain that was de deforesting in the 80s and you get a better thermal output from gas that's very true but we're still producing carbon dioxide however since 1956 and since the uh, cold hall opened about 20 percent of our electricity has come from nuclear it's nothing new since the 50s we've had this steady 20% baseline energy. Why is that a concern? Well, at the moment, it's reducing because all of those reactors are being phased out. They're being decommissioned. And if we don't build new ones, we're going to have 20% energy gap. How's that going to be plugged when we need more electricity and we're shutting down reactors? So we need to get on with a reactor scheme, which eventually has become underway. But that's why we need to, to keep this 20% going. What is encouraging is you've seen this increase in renewables. So uh, uh, both onshore and offshore, wind and solar are starting to make a contribution. But as you'll see, um, their contribution has increased, but at what cost? And is it a secure supply? It has other issues as well. But we're starting to look and question our energy mix. 
And that's the key. And that's what your generation needs to do. So that's where it comes from. How do we use this fuel? Well, to produce electricity, all we're doing essentially is boiling a kettle and using the steam to spin a turbine to put through a generator set to make electricity. So in any electricity power station, here's our kettle. We are burning our fuel to produce heat. That heat raises steam. We spin a turbine and link to a generator set to produce our electricity. Now the fuel we use can be burning fossil fuel, chemical energy, conversion of chemical energy, or we can use a nuclear fuel. So a nuclear power station isn't really any different to a standard generation power station. It's just a different fuel producing the heat to raise the steam. That's the only difference. And producing electricity from a dynamo is nothing new. If you go to the Black Country Living Museum, in one of their exhibits here, you can see this dynamo generator. And this was made by Thomas Parker Limited of Wolverhampton in 1894. And on the right hand side, you can see this little flywheel. They would have a, a Newcomen or a steam engine producing uh, mechanical power that would turn this generator and that would produce electricity to, to light lamps, for example. So technology is nothing new, but we're just moving away from steam power to nuclear power, but we're still producing electricity a little more efficiently and a lot more cleanly. But this technology is nothing new. And certainly when you want to understand where the steam has come from, the Black Cultural Museum is a fantastic place to visit. <clears throat> so the issue we have is that we want our energy. Um, we need to uh, burn the fuel, um, but we need to limit the amount of carbon dioxide. And as you know, and later, if, if you have a fossil fuel that contains carbon, if you have full combustion, you're gonna produce the carbon dioxide. So how can we produce more of this and less of this? That's, that's the key question. Well, we can look at renewables. Uh, wind power, you can see there's a lot of windmills around the country. They're not always spinning. In fact, if the wind's too light or the wind's too strong, they start spinning. They're just uh, uh, ornaments. Um, they also require nearly magnets. Those magnets uh, are in short supply. The carbon footprint of windmills isn't as environmentally friendly, but also you can't have a secure supply. You can't predict when the wind is going to change. You know our weather prediction is pretty, pretty woeful. It's a chaotic system, it's very hard. So it's not a secure supply, you can't rely on it. Solar panels, well, we've seen a lot more solar panels on roofs recently. Doesn't mean that we've got more sun in the UK. It doesn't, what it does mean, apart from government subsidies, is that we're making the materials more efficient at harvesting and converting the solar radiation, but we've still got more to do on there but it's part of the energy mix. But again, on a cloudy day or at night, you're not producing electricity, so you can't rely on these. Tidal, I, in my opinion, I think tidal's the only one thing that is reliable. Our Navy has been forecasting tides for centuries. We know the tide comes in, we know when it goes out, we can predict that. But having the mechanics and the seawater, it's a very corrosive atmosphere. It's a, an engineering challenge, but I think that of all is the most predictable. So renewables certainly has a play and I think it's gonna have an important part of the energy mix. But we need to make more efficient energy conversion, store this in, in batteries, increased battery technology, um, use of fuel cells, and that'll bring me on later to the hydrogen fuel cycle as well. The other option is to have nuclear energy. Nuclear energy produces um, a vast amount of, of thermal energy, but without any carbon dioxide. So it can meet our energy demands, but without any carbon dioxide. Now, there are issues. It does produce high level radioactive waste, but as you'll see, a very small amount of waste, and we can deal with that using chemistry. Um, but at the moment, if we can't do any of this, we can do some carbon capture, but that's not the answer. And carbon credits certainly aren't either. The other issue with, with fossil fuels is that the name suggests uh, Mother Nature took millions of years to produce them. We're burning them in, uh, in a very short time. There's a finite resource that they're, they're gonna run out. But also for the petrochemical industry, the, um, this is a feedstock for plastics, polymers, the paints, the, the, the bags, the things that we use come from the petrochemical in industry. So rather than just burning it, maybe we should use the oil sensibly for our plastics and our materials and produce our electricity via other means. So finite resource, it's running out. When it runs out, we can't make our plastics anymore. We might be able to recycle some, but uh, that has other issues. 
And the other key issue, of course, is because they contain carbon, because they came from trees and plants that have fossilized over the years, they, when they're burned, produce carbon dioxide. Greenhouse gases, climate change, as we've mentioned before. So those are the key issues, really. Just to show uh, uh, the, the uncertainty of supply, this is a, a plot of, of data, electricity generated from solar panels. These are some actual solar panels on my dad's roof. And I know it's a bit geeky, but I actually took the readings over several years. And you can see if the blue lines where electricity has been produced. You can see a nice sunny summer's day here. And you can also see winter here, December, January. The point is, they're not that efficient. Even on a summer's day, they're what, 20, 30% efficient. And at winter, they're not producing much at all. They don't start working until quite late and they stop as well. So we still have a lot to do to make solar panels more efficient. That's not to say we can't and we shouldn't, but at the moment, the technology isn't quite there, but it's something the material scientists and chemists need to think about. Now I mentioned the hydrogen cycle. This I think has got, is, is a really important player because if we can produce hydrogen, then we can have cars, we can use uh, uh, fuel cells and not just burning hydrogen to produce uh, water, but we can use fuel cells to get energy out of the recombination of hydrogen and oxygen. And the only waste product is water. That technology has been there since man was on the moon in 69. They used the fuel cells to power the moon buggy. And if we'd have developed the technology since then, who knows where we might be today. They still use fuel cells on the space shuttle. And in fact, in space, the water that is produced when they produce electricity is recycled and used to drink with. So there's a lot of uses of fuel cells. But on Earth, if we can power our cars or produce electricity for the hydrogen cycle, the two key issues of the hydrogen cycle are producing it and storing it. Producing it, we use electrolysis. We split the water using electricity. Where does electricity come from? Well, if you're burning coal, this isn't clean because you're, you're just pushing the pollution out to power station. So at the moment, if you're not producing hydrogen cleanly, it's not part of the solution. Um, we could perhaps use solar energy to produce that electricity, but we can also use the excess heat from the next generation of power stations to split the water, produce hydrogen cleanly. So if we can produce it from the, the next gen nuclear and store it correctly, it makes the hydrogen cycle viable. The solution's got to be a mixture of energy cycles, re renewables, the hydrogen cycle, as well as nuclear. It's not just one thing. I think it would be a mistake to just look at one thing. So that's the issue with the hydrogen cycle. What are we doing about it? Well, colleagues of mine, Peter Slater in the Department of Chemistry, is developing new materials for better batteries, electrolytes for fuel cells. And my colleague Paul Anson is defining these metallic sponges that can store hydrogen as well. So chemists have a role in developing the materials that are going to make this technology viable and possible. We're also obviously, as I mentioned, preparing for a deep decarbonisation of our energy system. And part of this, as well as the hydrogen cycle, renewables, nuclear power is expected to play an important part in this. Because as you'll see, it has a very high energy fuel density and doesn't produce the carbon dioxide. Now I've looked around both power stations. I've gone through a coal burning power station such as this one, and I've stood in a, a, an advanced gas reactor. And I certainly know which one I would rather live next to. And in fact, it's amazing. You stand on the floor of one of these, you get the roar of the furnaces, the soot, the dirt, just the amount of coal that's coming in by train every hour to feed this is immense. Conversely, fuel inside a nuclear reactor, a fuel rod will last for years before it needs changing. You stand in there, it's spotlessly clean and completely silent until you get to the, the uh, generating sets. So we're going to have a look at the why nuclear is so clean and energy density is key as well. So back to some chemistry, you'll be glad to see, and some thermodynamics. I'm now going to look at the energy density. So how much energy can we get from a chemical fuel compared with a nuclear fuel? So I'm going to go through the figures and we're going to normalise it to per atom. So per atom of carbon, per atom of uranium, how much energy do we get? And this will answer a lot of questions. And interestingly, this is a calculation that when I did as an A-level student, I immediately saw it and thought, well, why haven't we got nuclear power now? Uh, really, why haven't we? 
So if we go back to our thermodynamics, you'll know that in the uh, combustion reaction, and I'm going to look at petrol or octane here, a molecule containing eight, eight atoms of carbon. And for every mole of octane, we require 12 and a half moles of oxygen. And for complete combustion, those eight carbons then find themselves in uh, eight moles of carbon dioxide. That, of course, is where the carbon dioxide comes from. And to put a figure on this, if we sum up the enthalpy of formation of our products, subtract from that the enthalpy of formation of our reactants, we get this figure here, which is the enthalpy of combustion. So per kilojoule per mole, 5,000 kilojoule per mole of energy is released through this burning of petrol. That sounds a lot, that sounds quite impressive. And yes, when you do a whoosh bottle or you burn petrol, you can feel the heat. You feel the car engine when you've run a few miles. It's very hot, you wouldn't want to put your hand on it. Um, so that energy, we've got a lot of heat energy coming out from a chemical reaction. But when we start to normalize that, we divide it down by eight, because there are eight carbons in this, this, this mole of, uh, of octane, divide by eight. And if we divide, divide by Avogadro's number, we have actually got 1.06 to the 10th of minus 18 joule per carbon. So this is the energy we're getting per carbon. Whether that carbon comes from coal, gas, or oil, we've got a value for carbon. As you'll see, that's going to be important. So that's how we get it. So how do we get energy from the nuclear reaction? So this used to be covered in the A-level syllabus. I think it still is. It still is in physics. I think it's in chemistry still. Interesting, there's something called the binding energy or the mass difference. When you take an atom of a substance and you calculate its theoretical mass, because we know the rest mass of a neutron, a proton, an electron. And if we know, say, uranium, well, we know how many protons and neutrons are in there and electrons. We can calculate a theoretical mass. When you measure that mass with a mass spectrometer, for example, you find that it actually weighs slightly less. There's a mass difference. And some of the mass is converted into energy to bind that nucleus together, the binding energy. It's a very small amount of mass, and that's where the Einstein relation mass or energy equals mass times C squared comes from. It's a very small amount of mass, but it produces a lot of energy to bind the nucleus. That's the binding energy. And when you look at the binding energy curve, <coughs> you see it occurs at two extremes, for light elements here and heavy elements here. And there's a peak around here sort of iron or lead. So when we split by a fission reaction, a heavy nucleus down to component parts, there's a difference in binding energy. When we fuse two atoms together to produce something, there's a difference in binding energy. We can get that binding energy out, and it's a huge amount of energy, as you'll see from this calculation. So I look at the standard uranium. I um, interact uranium with a neutron, and it splits, as Lisa Meitner showed, into two fission products, two small rents, then you can split it into two. There's various ways it can split into two, but just for this one, it's gonna split into xenon and strontium and produce some neutrons. When you look at the binding energy for the uranium, the xenon, the strontium, and it's per nucleon, so you multiply that up by the amount of protons and neutrons in the nucleus, you then see that there is a mass difference. So the uranium on the left here produces xenon strontium and there's this amount of energy left over. Now that's a large amount of energy, almost 200 mega electron volts. Now I've used different units here, so let's convert our chemistry kilojoule per mole to electron volts and see how it compares. So there are other reactions, and this is one that Lisa Meinder undertook, looking at uranium and seeing that it's actually produced some barium, uh, some barium, sorry, some barium and some krypton. And it was that barium that was analyzed analytically. So that reaction also produced neutrons, but again, about 200 mega electron volts of energy, of thermal energy. You can see that some other neutrons are produced. Why are they produced, where they come from? Well, the other interesting point is when you look at the ratio of the number of neutrons to the number of protons in our elements, for light elements, there's roughly a one-to-one -one ratio. But as you go up, the heavier elements, they seem to need more neutrons in the nucleus to stabilize or to form the nucleus. So when we're going from a large nucleus like uranium back down to the two fission products, they require fewer neutrons. There's a neutron excess, so that's where those excess neutrons come from. 
Okay, so let's put this into figures. So if we go back to our carbon, our coal, our, our petrol, um, that turns out to be about four electron volts per carbon atom. Now you can say that, yes, well, if I burn gas instead of coal, I'm getting twice the amount of energy per mass of fuel. Well, yes, you are. You're going up to four to eight. Fantastic, you've doubled it. But when you look at uh, uranium, for example, and the amount of energy per uranium atom, we've got 200 mega electron volts. We're not doubling, not times it by 10. It's a huge increase. Now, even by looking at the numbers, how does this relate? Well, it means that nuclear power has got a much higher energy density. That means that for a, a gram of fuel, I'm getting a lot more energy out. So that means that to produce my electricity, to raise my steam, I need to use a lot less fuel. So rather than all those train trucks of coal coming in, I've just got one container of uranium a year. I'm cutting down. That means that I'm producing a lot less waste as well. Yes, my waste is radioactive, um, but unlike asbestos, that's the case, but I'm producing a lot less waste. So just the energy density is key. And to really realize this, you can see, well, how long will, uh, uh, excuse the old fashioned units here, but how long will a pound of fuel power a light bulb for? And if I use coal, that can keep my light bulb going for two days. If I use gas, I can increase that. It's not quite double, as I show my my figures, but we can go up to maybe three or four days using gas. Very good. But if we use uranium in one of the earlier generation light water reactors, that bulb has now lasted not days, not weeks, not months, but 64 years, just on a pound of uranium fuel. Now you use the same uranium fuel in one of our advanced reactors. Now we're looking at a pound of fuel, keeping that bulb going for just shy of 2000 years. So two days, or 2000 years from the same mass of fuel. The fact that it's keeping it going longer means that we're not producing all that carbon dioxide in 2000 years. Energy density is absolutely key here. And that to me was a convincing argument for nuclear, just the energy density speaks for itself. Yes, we have safety concerns, but we can address those. So as I mentioned at the beginning, all we're doing in a nuclear reactor is using this, this nuclear energy to produce that amount of heat, we're taking that heat away from the core to produce our steam. That steam then goes to, do, to drive our turbine to a generator set to make electricity. And then we just condense that water back down. That's why nuclear power stations are situated by the coast because we use the seawater to condense the water back down. We're not actually putting seawater in the actor, we're using it just to condense our steam. Um, if on land you have a reactor, then you use the cooling tower. So the, the stuff come out the top is not smoke, it's, it, it's steam, it's condensation. So all we're doing is using the heat from our reactor to make our steam. But what we are doing, of course, is containing all of this in a reactor building, which is a containment vessel. So there are so many safeguards to, to keep that nuclear energy there. And the only thing that happens when things goes wrong, now you may be thinking, yes, but what about Chernobyl? What about Fukushima? Yes, those were accidents, but the explosion that happened was not a nuclear explosion, it was a chemical explosion. The fuel melted because it wasn't kept cool. Uh, when it melted, it got very, very hot because even when you switch the reactor off, the fission product still generating heat. That heat reacted with the uh, zircaloy as a catalyst and it converted the water that was a coolant into steam. It then turned that steam into, split it into hydrogen and oxygen. That hydrogen found a spark somewhere and it was that chemical explosion that blew the rid off and just distributed the radioactivity. So it's not to be confused with a nuclear weapons. You cannot have a nuclear explosion in a nuclear reactor. The accidents happen are all chemical. So that's how a reactor works. Um, where do we get the energy from? Well, I mentioned that Lisa Meitner um, proposed this model that you have a fissile isotope like uranium. It interacts with a neutron and it splits into two. This was the the fission raindrop model. So for a typical uranium isotope, it splits into two. These are our very energetic fission products. There's a lot of energy here. Because of that energy, they want to shed the energy and they shed the energy in the form of radiation. That's why our waste products are radioactive because they're just trying to get rid of the energy from this fission process. Some of those neutrons, what happens? Well, some 
I say escape, they don't go far, they're absorbed into the cladding material. Uh, some go on to sustain the chain reaction because once you have the reaction in critical mode, it's self-sustaining, it keeps going. Um, but some of those neutrons in the uranium cycle do get absorbed by the 238 non-fissile isotope of uranium, and that transmutates eventually into plutonium. So in the uranium reactor, after a few years, you do actually start to grow in about a percent worth of plutonium. Unfortunately, that's why everyone has gone for uranium reactors, because countries wanted to produce plutonium to produce weapons. If we just wanted to produce energy, we'd have gone for something like thorium, for example. Um, but as I mentioned, beginning with unfortunately, the weapons came first, then they converted the technology to civil power, but they already had the things in place to produce uranium. So that essentially is what's happening in a reactor, and that's where the plutonium comes from. <clears throat> now, the two fission products, the nucleus doesn't divide cleanly into two every time. There's this bimodal distribution. Uh, in fact, it's quite random, but you can see the majority are strontium and xenon. Xenon's a gas, and strontium is, is an issue because if this gets into the environment, strontium, as you know, is chemistry, it's uh, group two, it behaves like calcium. Calcium can get into our body, into our teeth, and so if you've got a radioactive substance that's chemically similar to calcium and it's inside you, you're going to get radiation points. So that's why the fission products are hazardous to us, because we can absorb them. A bit like the iodine, iodine and the thyroid gland as well. That's got a shorter half-life of, uh, of eight days, but some of the strontium can last thousands of years. So we want to keep these fission products under wraps. That's why the, the hazard involved with, with containment and such. So in terms of chemistry of fuel cycle, I mentioned chemistry is everywhere. Uh, from mining the stuff out the ground, although these days we use chemical leaching rather than physical mining, but we need to convert that into a fuel, we need to enrich it, we need to turn it into a fuel. All of these stages rely on chemistry. We put it through our reactor, it lasts maybe three or four years in the reactor. Um, we then store it to cool it down physically, but also let some of that iodine and some of the short-lived radioactive uh, isotopes die away quite quickly. Once they have, um, in the UK, we close the fuel cycle and reprocess our fuel. In the US, they just take it out and, and bury it and store it somewhere uh, for future generations to deal with. We actually reprocess our waste. So chemically, we dissolve our spent fuel in nitric acid and we have a solvent extraction procedure that takes out the uranium and plutonium and we recycle. Our uranium goes back into making fuel and plutonium that used to go in the weapons program can now go back and be used in a mixed oxide fuel. So this is the ultimate in recycling. So imagine that we're using a fuel, we're making more fuel, and then we're using the fuel that we've made from burning the other fuel to make more fuel. So this is why a pound of fuel can keep your light bulb going for thousands of years rather than a couple of days. It's really getting the most out of the nuclear fuel cycle. Yes, there is spent fuel to reprocess, but we can reprocess that chemically and efficiently, and we have good waste treatment that we can deal with the waste. So in terms of my research and challenges, the industry are twofold. In our current fleet of fission reactors, um, I look at nuclear fuel performance and the aging phenomena. So how does our ceramic of uranium oxide behave within the reactor? Um, how does mixed oxide or thoria behave? And how is it susceptible to radiation damage? At the other end of the fuel cycle, I want to see how I can improve on borosilicate glass, which as a glass is prone to microcracking, how can I make ceramics that can lock away this radioactive waste? And even in the future, if we go back to fusion reactions, I go back to if we have a fusion reactor, um, we can produce a lot more energy, even more efficiently, but we still need to understand higher temperatures and high neutron fluxes as well. So there'll still be a demand for research. The techniques that I use in modeling um, actually have come from the gaming industry. So all those who can play computer games, thank you very much. They've helped the modeling of these materials. Faster graphics, um, parallel processing have really increased the computational power of modeling. But of course, you get the most accurate results from those that have understand how that technology works. So this is why we actually teach computational chemistry at degree level, so people understand how modeling works before they go into industry. What types of computer models to be used? 
Well, again, it's not one bit of software for everything. The key is in using the correct simulation code. And at university, we focus on something called atomistic simulation. But modeling can go from trying to uh, form approximations to Schrodinger wave equation to produce electron density. And of course, you know, chemistry and chemistry actions is all about electrons and how they flow. So if you can predict where the electrons are, the transition state, where they're gonna to go to, you can predict chemical reactions. Um, we can also simplify and simulate radiation damage. Ultimately, we want to get to the stage where engineers are modeling components, but with the data that's come from this level of code, where we put in the effects of aging and radiation damage. So that our engineering codes, their material properties database, isn't just pure materials. It's materials that can develop as a function of age. That's important because engineers designing bridges and buildings, the material is always assumed to be pure virgin material. What about corrosion? What about rust? What about radiation damage? You need to take account of that. So modelers join together and that's this, this challenge in the industry. So multi-scale integration. I use modeling and I think of computer simulation as an additional technique. It's not gonna replace experiments, it's an additional technique. Now, when you look at the structured material using x-ray diffraction, it's an averaging technique. It gives you the average of material. You can't see the little defects inside. You might be able to use solid state NMR to get some idea of local structure. But it's when you model and do computational chemistry, you can really zoom in to those individual defects at the atomic level. That's the power of modeling. And it really is another technique. And we use this technique very successfully to understand how the ceramic of a nuclear fuel performs, ages, and ultimately um, is degraded. So this actually is a, is a fuel bundle from an AGR, uh, advanced gas reactor from our Haitian plant. The ceramic is the little black ceramic in the middle there. It's encapsulated by stainless steel fuel pins. The, the carbon dioxide coolant gas passes over these to transfer the heat away. And this graphite sleeve is, is a moderator to slow the neutrons down so that they can interact. But how can I start to model this fuel? This is uranium dioxide in terms of my model. And by assigning equations for the forces act between the atoms, so we are simulating the ionic, columbic, and short range interactions of the system. So all of the chemistry that you know for ionic bonding um, can be simulated in these models. Once we do that, we can actually build up quite a large model and we can look at surfaces, microstructure, and learn a lot about a material just from a very straightforward model. We start with experimental data on structure, we understand bonding, and this gives us our model. We're not gonna go into the technique so much, but how can we use the model? Well, here's a micrograph of a high burn up fuel. And you can see on the uranium dioxide what looks like woodworm. We've got these little, these little things. And this is because, as we saw earlier, some of the fission products are krypton and xenon gases. If you form a gas inside a ceramic, it's gonna form a bubble. Those bubbles start to coalesce, they join into each other, they go to a grain boundary, eventually they're going to disrupt your fuel and burst out to the surface. We want to predict when that happens so we can put a lifetime on the fuel. So in order to model this, we start with our model uranium dioxide, we look at surfaces, we look at defects, we look at modeling grain boundaries. All of the effects that we see experimentally, we can model, we can put figures on, and it's much easier modeling uranium dioxide than it is trying to work with it in the fume cupboard. So this is a modeling really augments, not helps the experimental program. So I mentioned that once that uranium, after three or four years in reactor, actually it's not all fully burnt. The only reason we take it out of reactor uh, early is because some of the fission products actually happen to be really good at absorbing neutrons. So the neutrons that are required to keep the fission products going are actually mopped up or absorbed by some of our fission products. Also, these gases can deform the fuel. The fuel might crack. So there's mechanical damage and there's poisoning. So that's why we take it out the reactor after four years rather than uh, its full lifetime. So when we take it out the reactor, in the UK, we reprocess, we cycle. And that's twofold. Uh, what goes in is 3% uh, is the fissile isotope. Is that uranium-235? So only 3% of the fuel we put in actually fissions to produce our heat. What comes out, or spent fuel, 
um, we still have about 1% of that fissile fuel left. So it makes sense to recycle and reuse it. Um, we actually have 1% of plutonium in there that's grown in, transmutated. That's also useful for fuel. Um, but our high level radioactive waste, this really dangerous radioactive substance, only 3% of our fuel contains those fission products. So if we reprocess, we can reuse the uranium fuel. We can take, rather than throwing away a whole fuel element, we can concentrate our waste down to only 3%, store it into a bowl of silicate glass and, and store it in a very small volume. In fact, it's testament that all of the waste that we have produced in nuclear power throughout the 50s, and we've reprocessed fuel from other countries as well, all of that is sitting in cooling ponds, swimming pools, up in cellar field. It's not going underground, it's sitting in there because it's actually quite a small volume when you think of all those decades of nuclear power. Now, yes, we need to do something with it. We need to, uh, to put a, an underground repository, but at the moment, it really isn't a problem. And of course, it's always decaying away. So it's becoming less of a problem the longer we leave it. And like asbestos, that if you dig now, if you dig asbestos up in a million so years time, it'll still poison you. Whereas radioactive waste does eventually decay away, obviously at different levels. So the idea of reprocessing is to uh, concentrate down our very small amount of waste. And we do that, as I mentioned, chemically, and it's the purex process. We dissolve and do solvent extraction. And there's some very clever chemistry of being selective, uh, just extracting the uranium plutonium and then just taking the plutonium itself. We use an extractant and we, we alter the nitrating conditions to form neutral complexes. Neutral complexes of, of the uranyl species are then taken off. So a lot of chemistry there. So if that hasn't convinced you about energy production, I think, yes, but what about this nasty waste that's produced? And that's true, that is an issue. Um, but again, immobilizing the waste is key. And there's a lot of research that still goes on to immobilizing the waste. I've had PSC students have looked at these materials, these ceramics, cerium branerite and xenotime. These are excellent at taking in that high level waste, locking it away, chemically bonding it, not just putting it in a tub, but chemically bonding so it can't escape. And these happen to be very robust to radiation damage. Uh, now, for anything in the nuclear industry, you need a safety case. Why do we know these things will last the test of time? because they have lasted the test of time. These are minerals that are found in the Earth's crust, they're naturally occurring, and they have actually contained fission products from nuclear reactors for billions of years. How's that possible? Surely nuclear reactors are a modern invention. Um, well, not quite so. Two billion years ago, when the concentration of the 235 isotope was higher than it is now, there were certain conditions where water is a moderator. Water will slow down the neutrons so that they can interact and cause a fission process. And there is a certain site in, uh, in Central Africa, in the Oclo site, where in the 1970s, people were digging uranium dioxide for, for, to mine for fuel. But they noticed when they analyzed it, that the fissile isotope was in a drastically shorter concentration than they would have expected. Why is that? They also found evidence of fission products. So, it was a great mystery how come someone millions, billions of years ago had had a nuclear reactor. Surely that was impossible. Well, it happened in this cave. So what happened? Water, the groundwater came in, the groundwater covered the, uh, the, the, the uranite mineral that was there in such a concentration that it did actually go critical. So Mother Nature two billion years ago had a nuclear fission reactor without any cooling, without any containment, without any safety cases or paperwork. But the surrounding rock, the sandstone, the various rock, absorbed those fission products. It didn't destroy the whole of Africa. No one was transmutated or made radioactive. It was contained in this, in this bedrock. And so these minerals are really effective at locking away that high level waste. So that's the other end of the fuel cycle. And that's what we're developing in materials to improve upon the borosilicate glass that's currently used so that we can actually lock that waste away so that it won't leach in a material that's resistant to radiation damage that we can store, that it won't leach out into the biosphere. So you, hopefully you can see that chemistry is responsible for a lot of the materials. And finally, what do you do with that plutonium? Well, unfortunately back in the 50s and 60s, but it's used for weapons. 
Um, because of our reduction in stockpile, we don't need that anymore. So at the moment, the UK is storing it. And in fact, we've got a lot of it. We've got an embarrassing amount. We've got more than the whole world. We've got the largest stockpile of civil plutonium. But there are um, there's research designed to can we turn this into a fuel? If we can turn that into a fuel, then we will be self-sufficient uh, for, for years to come. We've got a lot of fuel coming there. So how can we take this plutonium and repurpose it into nuclear fuel? That's something that the National Nuclear Laboratory and other researchers are looking at as well. Currently it's stored in these cans of the plutonium dioxide, and there are some issues that alpha particles grab a couple of electrons, become helium, um, and these cans pressurize. So I've had PhDs looking at the pressurization of these cans or the aging of plutonium. Um, so that, again, is another uh, current point. Just finally, I'm conscious of the time, where do we go from here? Um, you may have heard on the news about Hinkley Point C and these huge reactors that are being built. I don't think that's the answer. I think they're huge, expensive uh, uh, things that aren't efficient. And in fact, most of the money that uh, there's gone on them will be paying to purpose loans rather than generate electricity. The one scheme that I think's uh, got real purpose, and I, I don't have shares in Rolls-Royce, but Rolls-Royce have got years of experience of producing reactors for our nuclear submarines. Um, they keep them going for years. They think so. The only reason a submarine surfaces on a four-year tour of duty is to get supplies on board for the men. It can produce its own water. It can produce oxygen to breathe, but we need food. So it needs food. That's the only thing that gets us up to the surface. So these reactors are amazing. And these small modular reactors have been proposed by Barnum Rolls Royce. And when you look at them, actually they've, they've got a, a lot, of, lot of benefits. So it's called a national endeavor and Rolls Royce are gonna produce these reactors. In fact, the first one is replacing the Magnus reactor in Wales, the up in Wilfa, um, where Hitachi were gonna build a, a, an advanced boiling water reactor. The Japanese have pulled out blaming Brexit but Rolls-Royce is going in to build one of these. And it looks a little bit like an armadillo. It's quite futuristic in design, but notice there are no chimneys, no stacks, no smoke, no pollution. It's entirely self-contained. And just one of these small reactors, rather than being built on site, is just constructed on site because every component is transportable by road. So you haven't got the huge construction costs you are just assembling something that's built elsewhere. They've kept the cost down. And one of these units can supply the power needs of a, a city the size of Leeds. Uh, and you can see just how many smartphones and light bulbs, and more importantly for the future, electric cars they can charge. The other important thing with Rolls-Royce, they're going to uh, energize or, or re-energize the UK supply chain. So they're gonna use the fuel from, uh, from plutonium and, and from the fuel produced by Springfield plant, rather than buying it from, from abroad. So we've got security of supply as well. So this I think holds, holds promise and you only need about 16 of these around the country to make a huge difference and give us the supply of energy that we're gonna need. The final thought, I think moving to the future, I still think fusion is a long way away. It's always been 30 or 50 years. I think it's probably further than that. It's a huge challenge. It's, is putting the sun in a box on earth. Now that, that's a huge challenge. How do you contain it? How do you get the energy out in a controlled fashion? It's, it's a very hard challenge, but we'll get there eventually. It's just, just time. Now I mentioned Thoria. Thoria is a really good fuel cycle. And if we didn't want weapons back in the 50s and 40s, we'd have probably gone with Thoria to produce our nuclear fuel because it doesn't need enriching and it doesn't produce plutonium. So it's what we call a proliferation resistant fuel. Um, this is very useful. For example, India uh, wishes to produce electricity. India has a lot of thoria supplies, um, which is very handy because we can't sell India our nuclear fuel because India hasn't signed up to the non-proliferation duty that said that she won't produce nuclear weapons. So we can't sell enriched uranium dioxide. But this is where thoria comes in because you can have reactors with thoria and it doesn't produce plutonium. So again, there's a lot of chemistry involved in making this, this fuel, but I think the chemists, material scientists hold great promise here. So I'm conscious of the time. Um, hopefully I've shown, first of all, that there's a lot of chemistry in the nuclear fuel cycle, that nuclear power has a huge energy density, which means we move much less of it, produce much less waste, and it's not producing carbon dioxide that's been linked to the climate emergency. 
Looking forward to the future, reactor designs are much safer and produce a lot less fission products, waste. But even the waste that we do produce, we've now um, developing and continuing to develop materials that will lock that waste away. So we're not leaving a legacy for future generations. Back in the 50s, a lot of this nuclear uh, waste was just stored in pond, thinking we'll sort that out at some point in the future. But even when nuclear power, power plants are designed now, decommissioning and waste is always taken into account. So that certainly is a big benefit. So without further ado, thank you very much. And I certainly welcome any questions. So hopefully some of the committee have been looking at the chat and uh, uh, I welcome any questions. So thank you all very much. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for that exceptionally clear lecture. Um, obviously linking chemistry to the nuclear um, energy production uh, and you've passed on a lot of information there. Um, I can't see the chat that's going to you, um, Mark, so I'm afraid you might have to look at the chat. Oh. I've only got a private chat on mine. Oh, sorry, yes, um, it's gone to the host rather than committee, so let's right. see. Okay. Um, so you may have a few, yes, excellent. So we've got here, uh, so what properties must the material in the neutral reactor have in order to absorb neutrons? Very good question. Um, so, so some different elements have what are called cross-section areas. So they absorb neutrons to a different degree. Um, control rods contain things like cadmium and that can, that, that can absorb a lot of neutrons. If you have a pressurized water reactor, you can alter the water chemistry. You can put boric acid in and boron 10 is very good at absorbing neutrons. That's another good neutral absorber. Unfortunately, as the fuel ages and it produces these fission products, they also absorb neutrons, which is what you don't want. So the properties that they must have is this neutron cross-section area and things like cadmium, boron 10 uh, are very good at absorbing these neutrons. And they're used for shielding. Um, they're used for shielding reactors as well. Someone's asked a great, do you think the UK will reach the 80% carbon reduction goal? I would love to say yes. Um, it's a huge challenge. We're not doing too well so far, to be perfectly honest. Um, but what I do think is good is that people are discussing it. People are being mindful of recycling, of energy efficiency. Um, although COVID has been uh, a, an awful experience for most of us, you just look at the effect on our planet that we haven't been driving, we haven't been taking cars out. Um, it can be done, but I think we need to put these policies in now and put our money where our mouth is. It's all well good making legislation, but you need the industry, you need the buy-in by the public as well. We need to do that. Um, so someone said, wondering, what's the difference between a light water reactor and an advanced reactor? Thank you very much, that's a very good point. Um, call it light water. Light water is, is normal water, water you take out the tap. And the water inside a pressurized water reactor uh, is used by two functions. It actually moderates the fuel, so you don't need any graphite. So it slows down the neutrons so it keeps the reaction going. But the water also takes the heat away from the core and transfers it elsewhere so you can make your steam. It's called light water because it, it, it is normal water. The Canadians use heavy water, the Candu reactor. And if you use a Candu reactor, you've got better neutron economy. You don't need to enrich your fuel. And the reason the Canadians had it is because they, they nicked a load of hot water, hot water, heavy water um, after the war ended. There was, there was a lot there that was used. Um, but at the time, it was under the, the, the kind of British. But an advanced reactor, things like, um, um, we're still using light water, but for example, you might use a different coolant. Helium gas is a really good and efficient way of doing it. You might use molten lead. Now you might think, why do I use molten lead? Well, think about it. If you have an accident, loss of cooling, that molten lead is going to solidify and you've enshrined your reactor in a lead jacket. Fantastic, you predicted it. Um, so there are other coolants and that's what I mean by advanced reactors. Some of the fuel might not even be a solid. The molten salt reactor, for example, uses thorium as a molten salt, a lot of fluoride salts. So there's a lot of advanced designs that, that use these different coolants. But we say light and heavy water, uh, meaning that um, we've got deuterium rather than the, the normal water. Very good. Where do we source uranium from? That's an excellent question. There are huge resources in, uh, in Australia and Kazakhstan. Uh, the US has, has resources as well. Um, Africa as well has, has resources. And 
you, you often think about, well, how, how much oil will, will we have? Are we running out of oil? When you look at the uranium reserves, we've got enough uranium to, to power reactors for, for, for a huge amount of time ahead. I forget the figure, it keeps changing. Um, but we don't, we used to just dig it out the ground and mine it. And that had its own issues because you still want the environmental impact. Nowadays, we actually leach it. We, we in Australia, they, they inject into the ground uh, and you can only do it in say where you've got sandstone, porous rock, they inject a solution into the ground that, that essentially extracts the uranium as a urinal species and reprocesses it. So it's much more environmentally friendly. The other way is that we use uh, where people mine precious metals that we all need for our smartphones and magnets or gold or minerals. We use their rock or their waste to take uranium because uranium is often found with other mineral deposits. So sometimes you can mine it from those as well. So there's a lot of sources, but we're trying to make it as environmentally friendly as possible. Uh, what are the state of precautions and dangers of those working with the nuclear energy? How will this be improved? That's an excellent question. Um, the hazards and dangers, to be honest, I would rather drive on a motorway, sorry, driving on a motorway in a car is more hazardous than years of working in a, in a nuclear reactor. Um, uh, because the, the reaction, the, the precautions are so stringent, everyone is monitored, and the monitoring is so sensitive that you can't have standard smoke detectors in the nuclear station because of the americium that's in the detector would set everything off. So the, it is the most tightly regulated industry. And when you look at uh, hazards and risk perception, um, we're bombarded with radiation every day. Uh, you, you go out, if you live near the coast, near granite rocks, you've got the radon. You go for a chest x-ray, an x-ray at the dentist, radiation. Uh, you take a flight when you're allowed to. You're exposing yourself to, to a lot of radiation. So it's not something that we, we don't have. There is a baseline there. And the precautions are such that they, they really are stringent. It's only under exceptional circumstances like what happened in, in Fukushima or Chernobyl where people are actually doing things they shouldn't do with the reactor. How could it be improved? The design is constantly changing. The, the new designs learn from Fukushima, they learn from the past, so they're constantly de designing. We are designing as we speak, I've got a team looking at something called accident tolerant fuels, fuels that when they lose heating, don't melt, they keep their integrity for longer. So we are still trying to improve the safety as well. So that links into a question about what can we do to reduce the likelihood of disasters, such as what happened in Chernobyl, Oh, Chernobyl was very different. That was a reactor that would never be built in the UK. It wouldn't pass our safety tests. Uh, it had no containment. And uh, what they were doing to it is something that we would never allow our operators to do here. Is it was military that were, were doing the tests. But what people don't realize is that actually the, the Russians um, had three other reactors, the same provenance as, as the reactor Chernobyl, same site. And they kept producing electricity up until the 80s. So the Russians kept that really dodgy design going up until the 80s, but they, they didn't have the problems with them. It was just what they did with it. But that sort of thing would never be built in the UK. We have uh, the, the Office of Nuclear Regulator. We have a design assessment for every actor. There's a lot of, a lot of thought that goes into the safety and construction as well. Cold fusion, that's a fantastic one. Um, if it were possible, that'd be wonderful. Um, there's a lot of, uh, lot of bait about it. Um, it's never really been decided, it's never really been, been proven. Um, I'm not sure if there's research still going on to cold fusion, um, but if it were possible, there is still fusion research going out there, that could be a possibility. It would certainly save a lot as well. And someone's mentioned finally, is there a possibility that uranium could run out? There is, there's finite resources, but because we're using such a small amount of it, it's gonna last an exceptionally long time. And because if you use it in a breeder reactor, you're using that uranium to breed more fuel. It's an odd concept, but you're burning fuel to make fuel. So it is gonna last a long time as well. Um, do I think the use of stabilizing salts and nuclear reactors to make them safer will carry on? Or do you think the design will change? Designs are constantly changing as well. And various salts that are used in the stabilizing water for, for neutron economy. Um, there's a lot of, 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 of water chemistry, reaction chemistry goes on, a lot of corrosion chemistry. So these things are constantly under review as well. So yes, I, I think that um, designs do change as well. And that's something we're seeing in the, in the advanced reactors too.
that's all the questions that come up. But thank you very much. Those have been some excellent questions. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and, and thank you once again, Mark. Um, can I just say that the uh, next lecture, next six form lecture, is uh, in a month's time, roughly on the 9th of March, um, which is uh, A level revision mathematics in the sixth form, um, Dr. Mary Jane Tremaine. Um, so if you think that would be useful for you or interesting, please do register for that event. Uh, and thank you once again, Mark. Uh, for an excellent lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. So this has been recorded. I'll start recording now and uh, I will make it available on the website for people as well. Thank you.